where you see the passing of time. We crowds in St. Peter's Square are praying like mad for the Pope's life. Where moments refuse to die. This is a momentous hour in world history. This is the invasion of Hitler's Europe. And where victory lives on. Plenty of girls are being kissed by plenty of boys they don't know, and they do not care. You can love it, hate it, embrace it, or turn away. Lennon was shot to death late last night outside his apartment building. But it is a past we all share. Come on out here and give me a salute. Big Navy salute. This is where yesterday has a home, where we wonder what it was like back then. Go forward, knights in safety. And not too long ago. His spirit must live on. It's where history has its place and where the past comes alive. The History Channel. Just months before the start of World War II, over 900 Jewish citizens of Adolf Hitler's Third Reich make a bold, desperate bid to escape the Führer's genocidal grip. From Hamburg, they board the St. Louis, a luxury liner bound for Havana, Cuba. Now the ship lays an anchor in Havana's picturesque harbor. Despite visas and assurances from the Cuban government that they would be welcomed, the Jewish refugees are told that they will not be allowed in Cuba and must leave the harbor. For these nomads of the sea, returning to Hitler's Germany means facing a bleak future for hatred, persecution, and almost certain death. If no nation in the world will step forward to save these Jews, what will happen to the countless others who remain in Germany? The doomed voyage of the St. Louis. The sea has long been a beckoning pathway for those fleeing tyranny. The downtrodden and put upon among the world's citizens take to the ocean seeking freedom from oppression. When such lonely souls alight upon her waves, the sea does all she can, then calls upon mankind to do the rest. November 9th, 1938, Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass that has been forever seared into the world's collective memory. Nazi dictator Adolf Hitler's brown-shirted stormtroopers rampage through the Jewish neighborhoods of Germany's cities in a carefully orchestrated display of violence and intimidation. Homes and synagogues were ransacked and set aflame. Jews attacked in the streets. Hundreds of Jewish men were arrested for the crime of being Jewish. For many German Jews, Kristallnacht came as a resounding alarm after an escalating period of anti-Semitism instituted by Hitler, whose hatred of Jews was fanatical. Though it had been thought that perhaps the growing persecution of Jews in Germany would subside and Hitler would be tamed by his power, the opposite happened. Hitler's revulsion for Jews became institutionalized throughout the Nazi hierarchy. Ridding Germany of Jews, whether through restrictive laws or other means, became the Reich's priority. Lisa Loeb, 
the daughter of a successful attorney and his wife, had grown up near Dusseldorf and experienced firsthand the burgeoning anti-Semitism of her homeland. As I grew up, I noticed that the neighborhood children with whom I had played from babyhood on were not playing with me anymore, were calling me all kinds of names which I, in the beginning I didn't understand. Liesel's father, Dr. Joseph Joseph, felt, as many other prominent Jews did, that the Nazi oppression would pass and life would eventually return to normal. Kristallnacht brought those idle hopes to a crashing end. I'll never forget the sight. Furniture was hacked to pieces, legs of tables and chairs were lying helter-skelter among books that had been torn out of bookcases. It, it just looked like a bomb hit it. For young Egon Salmon, living with his family near Dusseldorf, Kristallnacht brought terror and sudden separation. His father was arrested by the SS, Hitler's dreaded secret police. He was taken to the Dachau concentration camp. When he was let out, he was instructed by the guards in Dachau, that the next time they pick him up, they would, he wouldn't come out vertical, he would come out horizontal. And they gave him a time limit to leave the country. Bella Ulfelder and her family lived in middle-class comfort in a Nuremberg suburb. Their destinies, too, were forever altered. My father drove us to school the next morning as usual. But on the way, we quickly noticed that uh, it was not an ordinary day and school was closed. Um, and from then on, it was pretty difficult. Life was not the way it was before. Many Jews now realized that escaping from Germany was perhaps their best chance to survive and provide for their families. They were willing to go almost anywhere they would be welcomed. Ships full of Jews fleeing Hitler sailed to Latin American countries and even to Shanghai, China. Thousands of Jewish citizens had already applied to enter America, a nation that accepted immigrants using a quota system based on nationality. As far as the quota system was concerned, it was uh, established actually geared to how many people of that particular nationality were already in the country. So in fact, the quota for refugees or for or immigrants from Germany was quite high. 26,000, almost 26,000 people a year were going to be accepted. However, under these circumstances with the uh, Nazi rise in Germany and the incredible persecution that was already taking place in the late 30s, there were six times that many who were seeking asylum for most Jews looking to find refuge in America, it would take years for their quota number to be called. By then, who knew what life would be like for a Jew in Germany? In the spring of 1939, 930 Jewish refugees booked passage from Hamburg to Cuba aboard the Hamburg America Line's opulent St. Louis. For more than 700 of the passengers, Cuba promised to be a safe place to wait until their quota number was called and they could legally enter the United States, a temporary haven until the time their dreams could begin again. As young Bella Ulfelder made her way to the Hamburg docks with her family, the changing landscape of Germany was revealed to her in a somber conversation with her mother. My mother said to us on the train that uh, so far we have had all our wishes granted, but from now on we have no money and we would not be they would not be able to grant any more of our wishes and it would be best if we would not have any more wishes. The Jewish families, many of them prosperous, had been stripped by the Nazis of their wealth, their cash, jewelry, land holdings, personal property, prior to boarding the St. Louis for the voyage to Cuba. Most were permitted to carry only a small amount of currency. We were only allowed to take enough 
clothing for the two weeks that the passage would take. And we left all our furniture, all our other belongings in our house. And they were supposed to be packed at a later date and shipped to America. Of course, that never happened. We never got anything. I remember we had a phonograph, my sister and I, and we couldn't take it along. It was very strict. You left with 10 marks. You left Germany with 10 marks in your pocket and a few belongings. In opposition to their recent hardships, the liner St. Louis towered over the refugees at the Hamburg dock, a stately and elegant symbol of the freedom they hoped to find in Cuba. When I saw the ship, it was exciting. And, uh, well, uh, I was used to a pedal boat, no? It's, uh, it was magnificent and new adventures you know, out of this rut in Germany. It gave us new hope. On May 13, 1939, the St. Louis eased away from the dock in Hamburg, Germany, bound for exotic Havana, Cuba. 930 of its 937 passengers were Jewish refugees persecuted in their homeland and hopeful that they could leave behind the harrowing memories of the first six years of Hitler's intended thousand-year Reich. My mom's sister accompanied us to Hamburg and she stood on the pier when the ship left and I kind of knew I wouldn't see her again. So, um, I loved my family very much, and that was hard. Liesel and her family joined the rest of the refugees lining the decks of the St. Louis as they made their last farewells to their homeland. Still stigmatized, with a red J stamped into their passports, they whispered hushed prayers for loved ones left behind among Hitler's Gestapo and concentration camps and for their own uncertain fates. The waters of the North Atlantic were calm in the third week of May 1939. The passenger ship St. Louis carried an unusual cargo that trip. 930 Jewish emigres from Germany seeking temporary refuge in Cuba until they could eventually enter America. The exquisite liner provided all the luxuries of modern travel for the families on board, and children quickly shed the pall of oppression as they discovered the playground of her decks. As her parents pondered an uncertain future, 10-year-old Lisa Loeb delighted in exploring the well-appointed vessel. As I roamed around the ship, I made friends with the elevator man, and he let me run the elevator uh, while he took a smoke, and uh, I also made friends with the steward who rang the gong at mealtimes. But with all this uh, delight in, in, in the ship, there was a sadness also. For any refugee, it's a wrenching circumstance to leave everything you know. The people, the streets, the names of, of buildings, all the things that are familiar to all of us, and to walk away from it with the po very real possibility of never returning. Nearly two weeks passed as the vessel glided peacefully across the expanse of ocean. The pleasant atmosphere aboard the St. Louis made it easier for the refugees to forget the pain of leaving loved ones and country behind. In part, their comfort was due to the gallantry of the ship's German captain, Gustav Schroeder, who had strictly instructed his crew to treat the refugees with all of the courtesy and politeness due any paying passenger. Captain Schroeder 
was an exceptional person. He was very disciplined, he was very professional, and he had um, a professional responsibility for his passengers, so he had sincere regard for them, both as a professional sailor, but also he was sympathetic to their cause. Considering that among his crew were Nazi party officials and Gestapo spies, Schroeder's orders were little short of remarkable. Perhaps it was the captain's unspoken intention on the refugee's farewell journey to make amends for the injustices visited upon them by the German nation. The Nazi party leader on board, a man named Otto Scheindig, was carrying out his intentions and his orders to harass the passengers, but whenever that was seen by the captain, he was brought up short. Despite the occasional and random and sometimes organized conspiracy uh, to mistreat these Jewish refugees, he insisted that, uh, that there be civility. On a ship festooned with adoring portraits of Germany's strongman dictator Adolf Hitler, Captain Schroeder made the extraordinary gesture of removing the Führer's picture from the ship's makeshift synagogue in deference to his Jewish charges. It was another indication of the veteran seafarer's uncommon sensitivity. He was astute enough to understand that these people who had just gone through tremendous trauma of not only incarceration, of Kristallnacht, of losing everything, everything, that a man in the German uniform would be kind of intimidating uh, to them. Still, as the St. Louis steamed toward Havana Harbor on May 27, 1939, Captain Schroeder had received word that there would be difficulties disembarking his refugees. Recognizing the possibility of panic and despair at such news, he immediately convened a committee of passengers to discuss the oncoming problem. Among them was Lisa Loeb's father, Dr. Joseph Joseph. There were three lawyers, one businessman, and one doctor. And uh, he told them of his fears and what he had heard, and uh, that the ship before us was having trouble landing the passengers. And uh, they discussed certain uh, actions in case of an emergency. These gentlemen had chosen my father to be their chairman and uh, that's how it stood as the ship approached uh, Havana. Once inside Havana Harbor, within sight of the docks, the St. Louis was ordered by Cuban authorities to come to a full stop and drop anchor. The ship's deck was already crowded with passengers eager to disembark and begin their new lives, enthralled by the city revealing itself to them in the early morning's light. The first sight of the city of Havana was enchanting. To see palm trees, which I had never seen, and pastel-colored houses along the beaches and the capital. It was, it was quite a sight. The exotic beauty of the tropical city stood in marked contrast to the melancholy homeland they'd left behind. Many of the refugees took comfort in the knowledge that friends and family who had already fled Germany would be waiting to greet them as they disembarked. All luggage that was in the cabins had been packed and uh, readied uh, on deck. Tables had been set up to process everybody and people were standing in line, and suddenly everything stopped. A disturbing rumor began to spread among the confused refugees that the visas and landing permits for which they had paid so dearly might not be honored by a Cuban government riven by internal political struggles and rising anti-Semitism. 28 passengers who had paid extra money for special papers while still in Germany were allowed by Cuban officials to leave the ship. Captain Schroeder assured the remaining refugees that he would personally intervene with the Cuban government on their behalf. Despite his gesture of reassurance, fear spread over the boat. Everybody wanted to know what's happening, why aren't we getting off, and uh, 
the officials who had come on board just uh, replied with a smile, manana. 907 passengers remained aboard the St. Louis, freedom nearly within arm's reach. Just as in Germany, their welfare seemed dependent on the unpredictable whims of pitiless government officials. Now, with asylum so near, the refugees could hardly dare to hope. Would Captain Schroeder deliver them to safety? Was freedom from Hitler to be theirs? The harbor in Havana, Cuba, is known as one of the world's most grand and beautiful. To the 907 Jewish refugees stranded aboard the St. Louis, it must have been a bittersweet sight indeed. Two weeks earlier, they had sailed from Germany to escape dictator Adolf Hitler's program of hatred and persecution against Jews. After crossing an ocean with fragile hopes for a new life, it seemed as if the St. Louis passengers were becoming victims of the fever of isolationism infecting much of the Western world in the dark days before World War II. Four days after arriving in this famed Latin American port, they were still being denied entry. While negotiations continued with the Cuban government, Ship's captain, Gustav Schroeder, summoned the passengers' committee, headed by Lisa Loeb's father, to high-level meetings in his quarters. The committee men were with the captain. Morning, noon, and night, I hardly saw my father. Meanwhile, all these telegrams went out to President Roosevelt and to Mrs. Roosevelt and to even Chamberlain, uh, the Prime Minister of uh, Great Britain, and to various and sundry Jewish organizations and countries to help us. And help wasn't coming. The cause of the expatriates was taken up by the New York-based American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee, or JDC. The JDC was a humanitarian organization dedicated to helping oppressed Jews around the world. Herbert Katsky was a young administrative aide at the JDC when representatives opened talks with the Cuban government on behalf of the refugees. In Cuba, they, they told us that they wanted a certain amount of money put up as bonds, that the people would not become public charged. So the JDC offered to uh, put up a cash amount of uh, about $250,000, something rather like that. And the uh, Cubans said, nothing doing, they wanted. $500 a, $500 a person. Well, wait, JDC didn't have that kind of money around. As the talks continued, family members and loved ones of the stranded exiles who were already in Cuba hired small boats and went out to the St. Louis, trying to get as close as they could to reassure the frightened passengers. Fathers, husbands, other relatives, they started to come out in little boats that surrounded the ship every day, all day long, with people trying to yell at each other, yelling for, can you find so-and-so? And then so-and-so would finally come to the rail or to the porthole, and they'd scream at each other, but they could never touch, never uh, a hug or a kiss. Judith Steele was just a toddler then, traveling aboard the St. Louis with her parents. But the wrenching experience of being held hostage in Havana Harbor while her uncle shouted encouragement from a nearby small skiff stays with her to this day. My uh, parents and uncle were not able to uh, communicate. We weren't able to touch. It was just, uh, it, it was, I, I believe, a, quite a devastating situation. As the JDC's discussions with the Cuban government dragged on for nearly a week, the stifling heat and paralyzing uncertainty over their fate 
took its toll on the Jewish refugees. The roller coaster of emotions they must have gone through with great hope at one moment and, and crashing depression at the next moment. This whole experience of being so close and yet so far had to have been an incredible ordeal, emotional ordeal for all of these people. When shipboard rumors whispered that the St. Louis would be forced to return to Hitler's Germany, the news had a desperate effect on some of the passengers. A man whose wife and children were on the ship with him uh, threw himself off the ship after having slit his wrists. And uh, a crewman jumped over. They did rescue him. They took him to a hospital on shore. And, uh, but he simply could not take it. Last-ditch efforts by the JDC to secure a financial agreement with the Cuban government that would vouch for the St. Louis refugees failed. And on May 31st, Captain Schroeder was told that the ship would have to leave Cuba. He had done all he could to help his passengers, but still felt he had failed them. Finally, he could delay no longer. On June 2nd, with helpless friends and families watching from ashore, the St. Louis set out from Havana Harbor. The day we left was probably one of the saddest days in the lives of all of them on board, including the captain. And he, he writes, it seemed like we had left the planet and didn't belong to the world anymore. enormous liner slowly turned and headed out to sea. Its destination, the one place in the world the Jewish refugees aboard had hoped they would never see again, Nazi Germany. While piloting the ship as slowly as he could, Captain Schroeder posted a message to the passengers on the ship's bulletin board, providing as much comfort as was possible in these bleakest of circumstances. The shipping company is going to remain in touch with various organizations and official bodies which will endeavor to effect a landing outside of Germany. Despite Captain Schroeder's hopeful posting and the continuing entreaties by the JDC to the countries of the world for safe harbor, the mood aboard the ship turned fatalistic. The vessel's opulent appointments and luxuries seemed to mock them now. Cruel and ironic trappings of what had become a lavish prison. Yet the tiniest glimmer of hope still lingered. As the ship sailed north, Captain Schroeder edged near the coastline of Florida. Perhaps the United States, the promised land for refugees the world over, would grant these homeless Jews the asylum they so desperately sought. But America's mood at the time was not one of open-armed welcome for immigrants and refugees. One does have to remember that the country had been through a terrible depression. There were 30 million people unemployed. There were people all over this country who felt we can't take any more people in. I'm going to lose my job. The other problem was, if you change the rules for this ship with 900 people, are you then opening the floodgates? Uh, and would there be ship after ship after ship with thousands of thousands and thousands of people? And I think that was another element that the government feared. The outcast's last best hope for salvation would go unanswered, as would their personal telegram to President Roosevelt. Heavily influenced by his isolationist assistant secretary of state, Breckenridge Long, the American president refused to intervene on behalf of the St. Louis refugees. That America said no was something that was quite unbelievable because we were not too many. That we got a no from America was very uh, disappointing, to put it mildly. 
On June 6, 1939, Captain Schroeder reluctantly set a slow but direct course for Hamburg, Germany. Panic gripped the Hamburg America Line's premier vessel. One that left the continental world of the United States, one cannot imagine the, the, the fear that people had. The refugees no longer harbored illusions about what awaited them when they returned to their homeland. We were sure that we would be sent directly to a camp or possibly killed. The fear of going back to Germany was tremendous. I mean, that was a certain death. There's no doubt about it. Watching the impassive waters of the Atlantic Ocean roll by, they could only pray for a last-minute reprieve from somewhere. Or they would soon be at the mercy of Adolf Hitler and his Gestapo. As the St. Louis sailed toward Nazi Germany with its defenseless human cargo of Jewish refugees in June of 1939, dramatic last-ditch efforts were still underway to save them. In New York, the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee, the JDC, was still frantically trying to find safe haven for the refugees in some corner of the world. Sadly, there was little interest in saving them. The JDC at that time got in touch with the committees in Central and South America to see whether it'd be possible to land the passengers in any one of those countries. But uh, they all turned it down. Everyone kept turning it over to someone else. It's a German ship. It's Germany's problem. We in Cuba are a small island. We don't have the room to take them on. It's, some, it's not our problem. They don't have legitimate documents. We in the United States have a quota system. They can line up and come in with a quota system. Everybody had a reason for saying, this isn't my problem. And that's the tragedy. It had been more than three weeks since the St. Louis departed Hamburg. As the ship sliced through the Atlantic, the tension on deck increased. The passenger committee instituted around-the-clock suicide watches. Captain Schroeder, as despondent as his passengers and with his own optimism waning, began to consider an impulsive plan to ensure the survival of his charges. The captain planned in desperation to bring his ship in close to the English coast and set the ship on fire so that the passengers would take to the lifeboats, land in England, and would find refuge there. That was a desperate move. But it also is an indicator of how strongly he felt his commitment to his passengers. Captain Schroeder's far-fetched scheme progressed no further than the discussion stage. By this time, the JDC had called upon its European chairman, Morris Troper, to devote his considerable energies to helping the ship of exiles. Troper, known to be a tenacious and skilled negotiator, appealed to the governments of numerous European nations to rescue the refugees. Passengers waited for two interminable weeks while Troper continued his behind-the-scenes negotiations. By the end of June 1939, it was announced to the world that Belgium, Holland, Britain, and France would finally open their arms to the refugees. A profound sense of relief swept over the men, women, and children aboard the St. Louis, who now believed they would be spared the terror of returning to Hitler's Germany. They didn't know where they would land, but felt that nearly anywhere would be safer than returning to their unforgiving homeland. The passengers' committee fired off a jubilant telegram to the JDC's Morris Troper. The 907 passengers of the St. Louis, dangling for the last 13 days between hope and despair, received today your liberating message. Our gratitude is as immense as the ocean on which we are now floating. Accept the deepest and eternal thanks of the men, women, and children united by the same fate on board the St. Louis.
Under Captain Schroeder's watchful leadership, the St. Louis ended her seagoing odyssey, docking in Antwerp, Belgium on June 17, 1939. The refugees of the St. Louis, unwanted by the world, seem to have escaped certain doom. Forty days and forty nights spent in purgatory on the open ocean had finally ended. Decisions still had to be made about where they were to be sent. Those decisions, made in a haphazard rush, would come to mean the difference between life and death. For most of the 907 men, women, and children so recently liberated from the ship of doom, a tragic destiny still lay in wait. Countless nations had watched unmoved as the Jewish refugees of the St. Louis made their transatlantic bid for freedom in the spring of 1939. Now, with the refugees dispersing among the countries of Europe, the world again turned its back and concerned itself with war. The armies of Germany and Italy were already on the move. Lisa Loeb and her parents were among the lucky refugees sent to England. Within a year, largely through the efforts of her mother, Lisa and her parents boarded a ship that took them to America. They had reached the country that once rejected them. With awe, I saw the Statue of Liberty. My concept of America was probably one of skyscrapers and cowboys. And it was uh, a marvelous feeling. Susan Schlager and her family were dispatched to France and settled in a small village three hours from Paris. The persecution they sought to escape followed them even to this remote hamlet. They didn't like Germans. They didn't like Jews. They didn't, uh, we were again not very popular there. And then Hitler marched forward and invaded France. And we were picked up. And we spent, uh, I don't know how many months in camps. Susan and her family were eventually released and made their way to Marseille. There, they awaited the calling of their quota number and later secured safe passage to America in September of 1941. For many of the St. Louis refugees, fate was not as accommodating nor nearly as kind. The months of torturous uncertainty had taken their toll on Bella Ulfelder's father. Weary of trying to control their fortune, he announced to his family they would leave their final destination to chance. My mother was sort of upset that my father didn't say we were going to go to England since we had relatives there, but he was determined not to make up his mind where we, want, we were going to be. He wanted fate to take care of us. Bella, her sister and her parents settled in France and were arrested in 1941 during the Nazi occupation. They were sent to an internment camp. Bella's mother managed to arrange the release of herself and her two daughters, and they later fled to the United States. Bella's father remained in custody. He is believed to have perished in a Nazi concentration camp. Memories of him haunted Bella, even in her new home. I remember when I came here, I always had a feeling that for some reason or other he might have survived. And I remember walking through trains endlessly looking for him. And uh, there just was nothing. Judith Steele and her parents were also among the unlucky souls transported to France after the St. Louis docked in Antwerp. The Steels were arrested by the French police and delivered to the Gestapo in 1942, who sent them to a Nazi camp in the south of France. Here, amidst crushing despair, parents took desperate measures to save their children. 
Judith can still recall a pivotal moment in her young life which took place within the bleak, dispiriting confines of the labor camp. My mother was bouncing me on her knee and we were having a wonderful time. And all of a sudden she stopped and I can't, I, I'll never forget the look in her eyes when she stopped and she said, Judy, I want you to be a good girl, have a good life. And she looked so sad, so I didn't like the sadness that was there. And I said to her, come on, Mom, nothing's going to happen, nothing's going to happen. Let's play, let's play. And so we continued playing. I'll never forget the look in her eyes. They told everything. Later that night, Judith was spirited out of the camp by a Jewish resistance organization. Suddenly orphaned, she was left to wonder what became of her parents. For years, I used to think, well, maybe they're still alive. You know, there, there was no closing. Um, when I was in France, I, I always was under the impression, my mom and dad are going to come back. We'll live happily ever after. Forty years passed before Judith learned that they had been among the countless innocent victims of the Nazi program of genocide known as the Holocaust. Judith's parents joined an unenviable list of the 907 Jewish refugees who returned to Europe aboard the St. Louis, as many as 600 perished. Only a few hundred survived the war, mostly those fortunate enough to be sent to England upon landing. Within a year of the St. Louis star-crossed voyage, Captain Gustav Schroeder took a desk job with the Hamburg America Line. He would never again return to sea. In the years following World War II, the captain's valiant efforts to help the St. Louis refugees became lost in that conflict's mournful aftermath. But when Schroeder was ordered to stand trial for alleged Nazi war crimes, the passengers from the St. Louis proved that they had not forgotten his heroism. When he was somewhat destitute, some of the passengers from the ship who had survived sent him clothing and so on to help him. So they spoke on his behalf, got him acquitted in his trial, and then it was, I think, in 1957 that the West German government realized what a noble effort he had put forth and uh, gave him a medal and a citation recognizing his heroism. Years after the voyage of the St. Louis, Captain Schroeder returned to the burnt-out decks of the once stately liner. The voices of her passengers, both the blessed and the doomed, still echoed in her deserted cabins and passageways. For the survivors themselves, the memories remain fresh. How could any among them erase the hopeless feeling of being unwanted by an entire world? Basically, nobody wanted unless you were Einstein or somebody who was really remarkable, then gladly, you know, you could have gone anywhere, Switzerland, anywhere, but not as an as a, uh, average family, a mother, father, two children. Nobody needed that, nobody wanted that. It is difficult to comprehend that a group of 920 people, of which only 250 survived, was put into that situation. Thinking about it, it's still emotional. Some believe that the St. Louis episode was a calculated gambit by Hitler to test the world's resolve. If no one would rescue these Jews, would they intervene to help those for whom he had even more barbaric plans? It was a test case 
that was planned very carefully by the Nazis with co cooperation of the Cubans to show that the whole world didn't give a damn about what happened to persecuted people. People didn't want to be involved and people were silent. And one should never be silent when other people are in trouble. Historians, too, draw a connection between the failure of the world to act on behalf of the St. Louis refugees and the systematic slaughter of Jews throughout World War II that will forever blight the history of Germany. The political powers in Germany could say, here we are, we're just trying to be kind souls and letting this ship go, and nobody wants them and they're being turned away. So how can you criticize us when you are turning away these people? If the rest of you don't want them, then we'll find some way to, to take care of them. The end point is this. Had we been able to, to find a way to get these people in, we might not have had a final solution. I'm not certain about that, no one can be. But they couldn't make it in and the alternative was death. When the St. Louis refugees' heartfelt pleas for safe haven went unanswered, America squandered an opportunity to display her grace and nobility at a time when it counted most. The St. Louis saga ended with the same woeful cry that punctuates all Holocaust stories, the regretful exclamation of never again. Stories of bravery abound in the lore of the sea. Yet for each tale of courage, there is another of tragedy, to which the unforgiving ocean waves bear eternal silent witness. <laughs> <laughs>